Welcome to the Gospel Addict Podcast. I'm Greg Bryan. And I'm Jim Resty. We're gospel addicts because we believe the gospel of Jesus isn't just good news, it's the best news ever. We're addicted to the gospel because it doesn't just start us out in the Christian life, it is the Christian life. Join us as we look at the Bible through the lens of the gospel. Thanks so much for listening. Ever feel like being a good Christian is all about sticking to like this never-ending list of rules? Yeah, definitely. It's easy to get caught up in that. Well, today we're diving into Jerry Bridges' gospel-driven sanctification to unpack how our understanding of the gospel, you know, really impacts how we pursue holiness. Yeah, you know, it's interesting how Bridges talks about the Bible not just being a rule book, but um, more like a love story. Okay, I like that. He challenges that idea a lot of people have about the Bible, that it's just about increasing our knowledge so we can control our behavior. It's like he's saying hey, there's this whole other dimension to our faith we might be missing. Right, exactly, yeah. yeah. And Bridges would know. He even admitted that's how he used to approach his faith, too. It's true. He really opens up about that. Which I think a lot of Christians can relate to. We can get so caught up in the, you know, do's and don'ts that we miss the heart of it all. God's incredible love for us. Yeah, absolutely. It's like that quote, we're not human doings, we're human beings. And, you know, Bridges emphasizes that the Bible at its core is about God's relentless pursuit of us, not our frantic pursuit of his approval. That's a great way to put it. Yeah. When we really grasp like the sheer magnitude of God's grace for us, it changes everything. Mm -hmm. It totally reframes our entire perspective on sanctification. It becomes less about earning brownie points and more about responding to this extravagant love. Exactly. Yeah. A hundred percent. I love how Bridges even shares a story about how he used to like throw himself into being a good Christian, diligently checking all the boxes, Bible study, prayer, you name it, almost like he was trying to earn God's favor through sheer effort. It's that um, yeah, the classic performance-driven approach. And, you know, it's surprisingly common. Bridges cleverly categorizes Christians into three groups, and it's fascinating how many people fall into these categories. Okay, hack the bite. Tell me more about these groups. Who are they? Okay, so first you have those with a fairly low bar for what they consider acceptable Christian behavior. Right. They show up on Sundays, you know. Yeah. Try not to cause too much trouble and figure that's enough. I'm good enough. Yeah. Then there's the second group, and this is a big one, the super committed Christians who are all about outward signs of holiness. Okay. They're involved in everything, always striving to live right, which, you know, is admirable, of course. Yeah. But I'm guessing there's more to it than that, or we wouldn't be talking about it. You got it. See, both of these groups, despite their best efforts, often miss the mark. They might be outwardly good, but their hearts might still be clinging to the idea that their performance is what pleases God. They haven't quite grasped, like, the liberating truth of grace then, right? Exactly. Yeah. And then there's the third group, the one Bridges himself identified with. Uh Oh. This group is all too familiar with the feeling of never being good enough. Oof, yeah. I know that feeling. They're just, like, acutely aware of their shortcomings, those hidden struggles with envy or those moments of impatience that bubble up out of nowhere. It's the worst. They beat themselves up over their imperfections, even their thoughts, constantly battling that inner critic. It can feel like an uphill battle against their own nature, you know. Totally. So what's the answer for this group? Is there any hope? That's where Bridges drops a bombshell. The gospel is for these folks, too. Really? In fact, it's precisely what they need. Wow. But they often don't realize it applies to them because they're so stuck in that performance-driven mindset. They think, the gospel is for getting saved, not for how I live now. It's easy to relegate the gospel to, like, conversion, you know, (laughs) something we check off the list and move on from. So how do we break free from that? Well, Bridges talks about the importance of what he calls preaching the gospel to ourselves, which I think is fascinating. Preaching the gospel to ourselves. Okay, now you've got my attention. How does that work? So it's like this... It's the idea of constantly reminding ourselves that our acceptance before God, it isn't based on like our you know flawed attempts at holiness, mm. but on Christ's perfect work on the cross, right? We need that reminder, and not just on day one of our faith journey, but like every single day. It's like we need to hit like the refresh button on our hearts and minds, especially when we're tempted to slip back into that performance-driven mindset. Exactly. And Bridges actually shares how he personally started each day. By like reflecting on verses like Isaiah 53.6, all we like sheep have gone astray. 
We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Wow, that's powerful. It's recognizing that even on our best day, we fall short. But because of Christ, we are fully known and fully loved despite all our imperfections. Precisely. And that's the foundation for real lasting change. When our identity is secure in that, when we truly grasp that our worth isn't tied to our performance, it changes how we approach, well, everything. Our relationship with God, with others, and even with ourselves. It's like that pressure valve releases and we can finally breathe, you know? So how does this translate into actually, like, living differently? Well, I think Bridges points us to Galatians 2.20, where Paul says, the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And this wasn't some like far off aspiration for Paul. It, it was his daily reality. So we're talking about more than just an intellectual understanding of grace. It's about allowing that grace to like, permeate every aspect of our lives. Absolutely. It's about living from a place of already being fully accepted. Yeah. Not constantly striving to earn God's favor, you know, right. which, you know, it brings us to an important point, which is addresses this idea of easy believism. Right. Because some people might hear all this talk about grace and think, wait a minute, if my salvation is secure, if God loves me unconditionally, then does it really matter how I live? Yeah, exactly. It's the age old question. Does grace give us like a free pass to sin? And Bridges really tackles this head on. Which I'm sure we can all agree is a question that has come up more than once throughout history. Oh, absolutely. But Bridges, he points us to Romans 6.1 to 2, where Paul anticipates this very objection. He writes, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? And Paul's answer is a resounding, by no means. Okay, so not exactly a free pass then. Not even a little bit. Yeah. Because, you see, when we truly understand the depth of Christ's sacrifice for us, the magnitude of that grace we've received, it actually compels us to turn away from sin, not embrace it. It's no longer about trying to earn something we could never earn on our own. It becomes about, like, a response to this overwhelming love. Exactly. Our motivation shifts from fear of punishment to gratitude for this, like, undeserved, immeasurable gift. And that changes everything. Bridges dives into this powerful concept of dying to sin, which, to be honest, can sound a bit intense. What does that even look like practically? Yeah, no, I think that's where a lot of people get tripped up. Dying to sin, it doesn't mean we become superhuman, suddenly incapable of messing up. Yeah. We all still face those temptations, those moments of weakness. So what does it actually mean then? How do we reconcile this idea with the reality that we're still human, we're still a work in progress? Well, Bridges explains it beautifully. He says it's about sin no longer being our master. Okay. It's about being liberated from its power to control and define us. Right. But before Christ, we were slaves to sin. Our very nature was bent towards disobedience. But through Christ... That dominion is broken. Right. We have a choice now. We're empowered to choose righteousness, not because we've somehow like achieved perfection, but because we're united with the one who is perfect. Yes. Okay, that makes a lot more sense now. And that brings us to another important distinction Bridges makes. Definitive versus progressive sanctification. Okay, I've heard those terms before, but to be honest, I'm not always sure I have a firm grasp on what they mean. This is a big one. Yeah. And so important for understanding the process of sanctification. So definitive sanctification is like that decisive turning point, that moment when we're transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. It's instantaneous, complete, a work of God's grace alone. It's the already part of our salvation, already redeemed, already forgiven, already declared righteous because of Christ. Yes. But then there's progressive sanctification, which is the, you know, the ongoing lifelong journey of becoming more and more like Jesus. It's about those daily choices to walk in obedience, to put to death the deeds of the flesh, as Paul says, and to put on the character of Christ. That's the not yet, right? We're not yet glorified, not yet perfect, but we're on our way and we're not stuck where we used to be. Exactly. And here's the beautiful part. Both definitive and progressive sanctification are gifts from God. We can't take credit for either one. It's all grace from beginning to end. And that realization that our progress isn't dependent on our own willpower, that's incredibly freeing. It really is. It takes the pressure off, you know, trying to be good enough. Right. And allows us to simply rest in who God already says we are, his beloved children. There's so much freedom in that. And, you know, it makes me think about how often we try to muscle our way through sanctification, relying on our own strength instead of tapping into his power. That's a really important point. And something Bridges addresses when he talks about considering ourselves dead to sin 
specifically referencing Romans 6.11, he's giving us a powerful tool to combat sin in our everyday lives. So practically speaking, how do we consider ourselves dead to sin? Like, what does that actually look like in the messiness of everyday life? Right. That's the million dollar question, isn't it? And I think Bridges is so great at like bringing these big theological concepts down to earth. You know, mm -hmm. he really emphasizes that it's not about like, you know, conjuring up some feeling or trying to convince ourselves of something that isn't true. Right. It's about standing firm on the truth of what God has already done for us in Christ. It's like that preaching the gospel to ourselves idea we talked about earlier. Exactly. We have to remind ourselves of the truth even when our feelings try to tell us otherwise. Yes, 100%. It's about reminding ourselves daily that because of Christ, we are no longer defined by our sin. We are free from his penalty, free from his power. Like we are new creations. That's a powerful reminder, especially when we're like struggling with those persistent sin patterns in our lives, you know? It's easy to fall into that trap of thinking, well, if I'm truly free from sin's power, why am I still battling this? Oh, it's a constant struggle. And I think Bridges offers such a refreshing perspective on this. Yeah. He says that wrestling with sin, it isn't a sign that we're failing as Christians. Okay. In fact, he argues that it's actually evidence of our new life in Christ. Yeah, that's a thought-provoking statement. How is struggling with sin evidence of new life in Christ? Well, it's like this unbelievers don't experience the same kind of internal conflict, yeah. right? Yeah. They may have regrets or, you know, try to break bad habits, but they don't have that same sense of conviction, that awareness of sinning against a holy God. It's like we're suddenly more aware of the huge gap between our own attempts at righteousness and God's, like, perfect standard. Exactly. And that awareness, it can either lead us to despair or it can drive us to the cross, right? Yeah. And that's where Bridges wants us to land firmly planted in the gospel. So when those inevitable moments of failure come, we don't have to spiral into shame or try to hide from God. We can run to him, confess our sin, and receive his forgiveness and grace because that's where the true transformation happens. 100%. That's where the rubber meets the road. It's in those moments of weakness that his power is made perfect in us. This all reminds me of what Bridges calls dependent effort. Oh, yeah. I love that comment. It's this idea that we're called to put in the work, to strive for holiness, but not in our own strength. It's a both and. Yeah. yeah. We're responsible for our choices, for actively resisting temptation and pursuing righteousness, right? Yeah. But we do so relying completely on the power of the Holy Spirit working in and through us. We can't white knuckle our way to holiness. We've all tried, right? It's, it's exhausting and ultimately futile the worst. But this is the beautiful paradox of grace. It doesn't negate our responsibility, but it empowers us to actually live it out in a way we never could on our own. And that's why this understanding of the gospel of our identity in Christ is so essential for the long haul. Because let's be honest, sanctification is a journey, not a destination we arrive at overnight. There will be bumps in the road, times when we feel like we're taking two steps forward and two steps back. Exactly. And it's in those moments, you know, when we're tempted to give in to discouragement or throw in the towel altogether, that we need to preach the gospel to ourselves once again. To remind ourselves that our progress isn't what earns God's love. It's what flows from it. Precisely. It's that love, that unconditional acceptance we receive freely through Christ that fuels our continued growth. It's what motivates us to keep getting up, yeah. even when we stumble, and to keep pressing on toward the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. It's a powerful message, and I think it's one we all need to hear, especially when we're feeling discouraged or, you know, stuck in that cycle of performance-based living. Absolutely. True holiness, true sanctification. It isn't about striving for some unattainable standard of perfection, you mm -hmm. know. It's about resting in the finished work of Christ and allowing that grace to transform us from the inside out. It's about living each day from that place of already being fully known and fully loved and letting that truth shape every aspect of our lives. What freedom. So as we wrap up this deep dive, what's one thing you hope our listeners will take away from our conversation today? You know, if you only remember one thing, let it be this. You are fully loved and accepted in Christ right here, right now, just as you are. Let that truth sink deep into your heart and watch how it changes everything. What a great way to sum it all up. Until next time, keep diving deep into the truth of God's word and keep preaching the gospel to yourselves, especially when you need it most. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Gospel Addict Podcast. Feel free to contact us via email at gospeladdictpodcast at gmail.com. Stay tuned for our next episode and remember... 
On your worst days, you're never beyond the reach of God's grace. And on your best days, you're never beyond the need of God's grace. See you next time.